our first event, what we call part one, in a three-part series called The Future of Public Space. The idea came from a chat with Yulisa and in particular Michael De Beer. Each of us and our organizations and institutes had worked in different ways around public space. We're doing work with different kinds of entities. We just wanted to keep the conversation going and learn from others, keep our minds open. And so instead of keeping the knowledge to ourselves, we really wanted to open up to the public as much as possible. And one will focus on control and ownership. One will focus on activism and appropriation. Today we thought we'd focus on African cities and public space. Um, I'm just providing an introduction for this evening, so I'm just sort of setting the scene. I've called my presentation The Future of Public Space or Public Space of the Future. Um, my goal is merely just to confuse you and then Barbara and Olivia come and, and <laughs> try to make sense of everything. So I'd like to start off with the sort of argument that there is in fact an abundance of public assets and public space. It depends on who controls us, owns us, and lobbies for this, and how we define inclusivity. And also on a more practical level, what's the point if there's no place to sit? So we work with a property developer called Block through the heavy City of Cape Town guidelines to develop a public space or a parklet on Region Road in Seapoint. We looked for about a one and a half kilometer stretch and what we noticed were staff at the Apsa sitting against the wall on lunchtime on the pavement, staff at Checkers sitting against the wall at lunchtime in the sun, trying to find shade. So without being able to afford a um, coffee or the coffee to get to the free Wi-Fi, you can't sit anywhere, there's no public seating, um, even though there was a promenade just a block away. So these are just some photos of the use of the public space. It has bike parking, free Wi-Fi, it was designed by Gap Architects and Urban Designers who are also presenting today, and uh, implemented by Cameron Barnes uh, Furniture Design. All of this is public, the streets, the roads, um, the idea is actually from Kylie Jacobs of Jakupa who says that our roads are actually public spaces, it's owned by the public. Our um, infrastructure in between all public and yet there's no single place to sit on a very vibrant and sort of successful street. These are just some of the humans of New York but humans of Sequent that <laughs> we've captured. It's, these aren't staged. These are real. That's just somebody on a device also not staged with their bicycle and their notebook uh, working using the free Wi-Fi. Okay, we all love celebrating public space. We're so proud and people unite. Um, but in the age of global terror, the very right to public life and space is being threatened. So what we come to celebrate, um, sitting on pavements, gathering in public spaces, being part of protests and movements and roads in the sport and all sorts of things. And now the success of that becomes a threat for terror. And have any of us here actually sat down with the National Security Agency or anybody related to national security actually think about how successful public states have become these, these sites of terror? And then at which level should we start to engage with these national security issues? Of course, we're all very proud of people gathering Kyron around the world, using social media and using the internet, um, using their freedoms to gather and, with the help of the American government, overturn their government. Um, this is Lahore Park. Before 70 people were killed last Sunday with the terror attack, um, mainly kids as well and mothers. Um, and this is what we want, but are we prepared to engage about the risks of this? And does design, designers, practitioners, researchers, do we have any role in um, the middle ground between this and this. I prefer the word public realm rather than public space, but nobody would come to an event called the future of the public realm. I consider the public realm any point in time in which you leave your home and become sort of a public person. So the signage, uh, the size of the pavements, um, the lighting. And what we found is that public space is actually really complex. There are different owners and different parts of it. And because government for many reasons needs to understand them in parts, we have to work in parts. We have to understand the public realm or the public system a bit better. And I'll give you a bit of an example. Uh, it might sound a bit academic. This is part of the lovely Seapoint Promenade. What we didn't know when we started our work on looking at bicycle parking for the promenade is that the promenade is actually chopped up into different, into different zones or different areas. So in this one picture, we had to go through nine what they call whaling applications to, to figure out what was beneath the ground. And then secondly, we had to figure out who owned each park. So you wouldn't believe it. Sand is owned by sports and recreation. If you put the bike parking in the grass, that's the best part. That's city parks. They love everything. Uh, we work with them really well. So that's where we went. And if you go anywhere near the pavement of the road, there's transported roads and stormwater. And that's going to take at least a year to get anything done. Um, so don't try your luck there. So what we see as this is actually a number of chopped up bits and pieces. And so we need to think of a public realm, which includes departments, signage, all these different cogs that make this public system. Uh, and thinking in these sorts of systems at least helps us to inspire our work beyond silos. So there are some battles we need to pursue 
in some cases it does make sense to tackle transport roads and stormwater if you really are passionate about that spot being the right spot for your public space or your art intervention. Again here, this is just a square in front of a library, but kids across the road, they use the square as the after after school, the taxis wait over here, librarians have a market there over here, the fountain's dysfunctional, the kids with the fence being put up at the city of Cape Town, the kids now wait outside the fence instead of inside because when the taxi comes, they have to run outside. The headmaster and this, the librarian stay late in case of taxis being late or kids' parents not picking themselves up. The kids who come to the school travel at least an hour to get there every day. So where we just see a, a hall and a library and a school, there's a system working here. The moment the headmaster refuses to stay a bit late, the kid waits outside alone. Fortunately, this intersection here is one of the few in Cape Town where when the lights go green, everybody gets to stop. All the cars have to stop at the same time. So there is a public space system, not just a public space. Um, how do we know if we made a real difference? Uh, I was an actuary and I like a bit of sort of finance and numbers and things. And to what extent can we measure, even more importantly, communicate change, spending error? Is there a quality we cannot measure or track? We came up with this uh, tool for uh, Thornhill Hill Park and Greenpoint. We wanted to know what the perfect community park looked like, so we developed, um, we copied the Sustainable Building Assessment Tool for Green Buildings and applied it to a park. And this is before the transformation of the park took place, and so we'll do this again after. But if you ask me what makes Greenpoint Park special, I couldn't tell you uh, through numbers and statistics because there's the quality or ambiance, a number of features that come together that makes uh, a public space or a park work. Uh, while major strides we made to make everything digital, we all know about the Wi-Fi hotspots going across Cape Town, is the true potential of our public realm not in being social or non-digital. Uh, this is a box we did three or four four years ago now, uh, asking people for ideas. If you compare it to the city of Cape Town's, not to pick on them, most public participation processes, they get about three or four comments. It's on page seven of the Burger or the Cape Times. Nobody reads it. No young person reads it. In one day here, we get 170 comments in a period of six hours, just asking people walking by in the public space their idea for the city. So yes, we're moving towards Wi-Fi, moving towards apps, but if you really want people's input into public space, you can do it and public space is a great platform for that. To do more than focus on the production of external spaces and places that we declare public, um, how many of you have been to Eastern Food Bazaar? Isn't it like the best indoor public space, actually, in fact? Um, the food is debatable, but they make the best garlic naan bread. Uh, we should do more than focus on external notions of public space. It's hard to think of indoor libraries, civic assets, and enhanced indoor public space. We got to work on a very cool project where we rented an auction house for the Dutch consulates and some Dutch designers, and we transformed uh, two stories of the building into a public space for collaborations and workshops, and um, really welcomed over 1,600 people in two weeks. So those steps in front of City Hall are quite daunting for the public to go up into. Even though you have a public design festival, you have to think about what makes indoor public spaces accessible as well. And then we've been thinking a bit about the future. There's some cool people who run a website called Future World, they're a consulting group, and they've developed these newsletters that sort of send from the future, and they come directly to your inbox. And we've been thinking about this series, but also in our work, why haven't we thought about the inevitable changes and what's coming next? Um, these are just snippets from these newsletters. This is from 2026. Uh, will you finally activate those robotic employees that you bought in 2024? How about upgrading the 3D material and furniture printers? So what happens when we start producing our own furniture with 3D printers? and robotic employees to, to do cleaning services of public spaces. 2028, um, we all thought cars would go away, but cars are back with green car technology. People now sit back in their cars. Contrary to popular belief, people are actually not spending their commute catching up on work, but lying on their backs and looking at the clouds. This is 2028. Nobody's looking out the window anymore. 2030, nanorobots. You can now have a flash drive, which adds to the memory of your brain. You can memorize any language. Uh, nanobots that we use to augment our natural intelligence can now be ingested. Um, just with a glass of water, and they'll find their way into our brains, upload information. At conferences, delegates simply swallow the nuts and go home. <laughs> it's not here yet, but you know, who knows the next events, the next two events. Um, and I did something horrible. I asked Hanley and Alex, and they started working with us to try and start mapping these scenarios. Um, we're getting there. We've just chosen three of them, but um, if we're going to be working in public space in the future, we should have some idea what that future looks like.
ጨጣ የደረሱ ሁሉ ወጣታ ተመ ወጣት ከነጽ አላለም ትባላለች ታሪካዊቷ የጎንደር ከተማ ቀበሌ 16 ልዩ ስሞች ይችላል ከባቢው ተወዳደገች